Welcome to Case of the Week. This week I've had a couple of interesting cases that's made me review my use of colour Doppler in the rotator cuff of the shoulder. Uh, traditionally, I haven't really found the use of Doppler all that useful uh, in my assessment of shoulders, with the exception being looking for flow in cases of biceps tenosynovitis and also flow in the rotator cuff interval with glenohumeral joint synovitis and adhesive capsulitis. But my application of Doppler on the subscapularis tendon, the supraspinatus tendon, the infraspinatus tendon, etc., has generally been fairly disappointing. Um, I can often see pathology in these tendons with my B-mode assessment, but when I try and use colour Doppler to show some hyperemia of these tissues, I'm usually disappointed. But this week I had a couple of cases that have made me think differently about this. The anthesis is a really amazing piece of engineering. Uh, it's made of four different zones. So it's the construct that we need to attach a piece of collagen, which is very soft, onto a piece of cortical bone, which is very hard. So the layers that are involved in this process are, first of all, the soft collagen. So this is pure soft collagen. It's the tendon itself. And in this case, it's the supraspinatus tendon. As that tendon then approaches the bone, you can see that it turns black. If you look in here, there's this black layer through here. And this black layer through here is unossified fibrocartilage. So it's quite a bit stiffer than the collagen, but it's nowhere near as hard as the cortical bone. So it's a bit of a uh, adaptive area where we're starting to translate something very soft into something slightly firmer. The next layer, which to us looks like the bone, this looks like the cortical bone, however, at the at the uh, area of an anthesis such as this, this is not actually cortical bone. This is calcified fibrocartilage. Now, the calcified fibrocartilage is stiffer again than the unossified fibrocartilage, but again, still softer than the bone. And it's this layer that gets damaged and leads to the subperiosteal cyst formation that we see when we see traction injuries to the supraspinatus tendon. Underneath that, we have then the cortical bone. So the cortical bone is very hard, and that's the way that an anthesis is constructed. So if you look at it here on an ultrasound, you can see it's soft collagen, unossified fibrocartilage, calcified fibrocartilage, and cortical bone. Uh, here on these other anatomical pictures, you can see this is hyaline cartilage here. So this is the articulating cartilage of the humeral head. Here's the collagen of supraspinatus. And this area here is the unossified fibrocartilage then transitioning into cortical bone. And you can see the same thing on this diagram as well. And yes, that's my uh, Labrador Dusty trying to make herself heard on the webinar production. Now, <laughs> The architecture of the anthesis has another important feature, and that is that this area here, the anthesis area, has to be completely devoid of blood vessels. It makes no sense that we should have blood vessels moving from the cortical bone through into the tendon at the area of a tendon attachment to the skeleton. If this was the case, when we move, when we articulate around, these blood vessels would get compressed as the collagen of the, uh, of the tendon here becomes under load during activation of the muscle belly. So this should always be an area where there is no blood vessels. It should be impossible to have blood vessels that cross across the anthesis. However, in pathological cases, this is not always the case. So this is an example of a supraspinatus tendon that shows fairly obvious B-mode characteristic evidence of subperiosteal cyst formation and associated either tendinosis or more likely a partial thickness tear of the supraspinatus here at the anthesis. And what we notice when we use the advanced dynamic flow here, and this is a very sensitive algorithm for looking for, for blood flow, is that we have many vessels crossing over the anthesis. So these vessels are migrating from the cortical bone through the anthesis into the tendon and vice versa. So this is clear evidence of a breakdown of the anthesis. You can think, if you like, of the anthesis a bit like the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and so it should be a, a really uh, demilitarized zone, if you like, where things are not allowed to cross over. So it's a, it should be impossible to have vessels crossing over. However, when you get a breakdown of this zone, then you can get vessels like this crossing over the anthesis, and it's always going to be associated with a breakdown and pathology of the anthesis itself. 
Here's another case where you can see quite clearly in B mode again that there's some destruction of the anthesis, there's some traction anthesopathy, subperiosteal cyst formation, and then associated B mode changes in the supraspinatus tendon adjacent to the changes in the anthesis. And once again, when we're using SMI in this case, you can see the myriad of blood vessels crossing over the anthesis. And this is clear evidence that we have an anthesopathic disease process at play. Another use of Doppler in the rotator cuff is the evaluation of tendinosis. So this is a supraspinatus tendon and it doesn't look like there's any significant tear here. The anthesis is very, very smooth. However, the collagen of the supraspinatus looks a little less echogenic than what I'd like it to be. So it looks a bit, a bit soggy, a bit washed out. And this, I think, is really characteristic of tendinosis of the supraspinatus tendon. You don't see this all that commonly because most times when the supraspinatus fails, it fails at the anthesis. It is generally fairly healthy collagen that just happens to fall off the bone, off the anthesis. However, in this case, the thesis looks really healthy, the bone is really smooth, however the tendon itself looks like it's tendinopathic and degenerative. When I put the Doppler on this, and again I'm using advanced dynamic flow here, you can see uh, how much vascularity there is inside this supraspinatus tendon. Now to achieve this type of image, what you need to do is not have the patient in a modified crass position. You must have the patient with their hand resting in their lap. I ask them to go really soft and floppy so to let all the sort of energy drain out of their deltoid and their rotator cuff muscles. Let them get really relaxed and then use really light transducer pressure. You can see I'm barely touching the skin, in fact, you can see in this corner here, I've sort of left the skin with the transducer using very light transducer pressure, a very low PRF and lots of gain, so much gain, in fact, you get a little bit of artifacts scattering around. However, this shows me this systolic diastolic component in these pixels here show me this is real flow. And if this was an Achilles tendon or an extensor carpi radialis brevis in the tennis elbow patients, you'd say it's a no-brainer, it's quite simply tendinosis. This is the same thing, but we're seeing it in a supraspinatus tendon. In the long axis also, you can see that uh, while the anthesis looks pretty good, the uh, tendon itself has uh, B-mode characteristic changes of tendinosis, and then with the Doppler here, you can start to see some flow inside that tendon. So I think with the new modern uh, high sensitivity to low flow Doppler algorithms, we can have an, another revisit, if you like, of the use of Doppler inside assessment of the rotator cuff. And I'm starting to see flow in patients with bursitis, I'm seeing flow in patients with anthropopathic disease processes, and I'm seeing flow in patients with tendinopathic disease processes in the rotator cuff. It's another button I'm going to be pushing more often, and I think it just adds to my diagnostic output doing rotator cuff ultrasound. Happy scanning and bye for now.